I really love this power strip we got back here. This is the deal. This is the deal. That's it. What do you say? What do you say? You're live? We are on. Perfect. Well, hello. How's it going? I'm having a ball. I'm having a ball. It's just a Tuesday in uh, sunny Florida while it's raining outside. Yeah, that's it. Every day it's uh, either 95 or pouring down rain. Or both. Yeah, same time. That's <laughs> it. Well, the good thing is, is it's sunny here right now in the penthouse. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? Let's slide the old uh, teleprompter up there, Jay, sir. Let's see what we got going on for us, that middle one. Yeah. So we got some quick tips yep. for faster builds. Okay. So that's, I see a lot of questions, you know, whether it be um, the Facebook group that we have mm -hmm. or just rod builders in general, they ask for, you know, well, how long does it take to build a rod, right? Right. And the, the answer can vary depending on what you're working with. Naturally. So we're going to hit you with some quick tips to cut down the time on how to build rods. That's a great point. And you know what we're going to do in addition to that, no matter if you are a new rod builder, some people call it a novice rod builder. I'm right. a beginner. I'm, uh, you know, trying to go from, I mean, I remember when I first started building and I have cut that time way down. Yeah. And, and mainly just because I've gotten better at the craft. And then I've also learned, half of it is just trying to like, well, do I hold this with my left hand or that with my right hand? Or how do I put the guide? And, and of course, you know, you see the questions in the group, right? Well, what's, what do you use this or what do you use that? And, the great thing is everybody in that Facebook Live group chimes in, gives you an idea. But the best part is, is the first one, don't, don't time yourself on the first one. <laughs> right. Then you get later on. But what we'll also talk about is if you want to be or you are a professional rod builder and maybe, you know, you want to, maybe you got somebody that's like, I want you to build four of these matching for my big sport fishermen. Uh, maybe how to do more of a production line style build right. rather than doing everything start to finish and then going to the next one. We'll show you a few tools. Got the RBS Pro Power Wrapper here. I know we got the three rod dryer back here. We're going to show you a few cool things about that. Maybe how to cut down on some of your time building fishing rods and spend a little more time outside on the water. Yep. So. And we do have some reamers as well. We're going to talk about the tape reamers nice. versus the extreme reamers, the benefits of both. Yeah. And then we're also going to be talking about, uh, I don't know if you mentioned the, uh, you know, finishing using your epoxy mixer versus just kind of doing it by hand, you know. Yep. So there's a few How to tips. put a little finish on with this guy and, here. And yeah, using your RBS Pro to put finish on, mm -hmm. uh, especially those longer uh, diamond wraps or cross wraps yes. and uh, under wraps, you know, a couple different options there. So. Yeah, because if you can shave five or six minutes off of every step, next thing you know, you're saving an hour. So exactly. we're going to show you guys how to do that tonight. Four quick tips for faster builds. It's July 28th and we're in the penthouse. You want to get this thing going? Let's do it. Let's do it. Hit that. There is nothing wrong, nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. We are back. We are back. I love bringing out some of the stuff that we haven't used in the past. Absolutely. So it's good. All right. So uh, for those just joining us, joining us, welcome. We're doing quick tips for faster builds. Uh, we got the normal cast of characters here in the building tonight, and um, we. What do we want to start with? What do we want to start with? Well, be sure to stick around. Of course, whole show. Uh, for those that have put the questions up in that Rod Builders Workshop Facebook group, that is a great place to go before the show and after the show to get all your questions answered. Thank you to everybody, and we are closing in on 10,000. Very close. We are, I'm telling you, we're right there. We're like a size A thread here. 2,000? 2,000? 200. 200 people away. Excuse me. We're 200 people away. We are literally a size A thread 
from 10,000. And again, I told you, your credit card's coming out. It is. And we're doing something big. big. <clears throat> so by the next show, it's going to be 10,000, I hope. And it'll be big. And uh, it's going to be great. It's going to yeah. be real, real good. We've got a whole list of questions here from that Rod Builders Workshop group. We appreciate everybody in there. And uh, again, we're going to do some giveaways. We're going to do some demos. What do you think? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, we might as well give a little sneak peek of the giveaways, right? Okay. So I, I, like mentioned, I mentioned Reamers mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. So our third place giveaway is yep. going to be an uh, Extreme Reamers set. We're also going to be giving away the, uh, I believe the four spool advanced hand wrapper. Well, that's a good one. Which that's a really great prize. I love where we're headed with this. Yeah. And then um, our, our grand prize tonight is a CRB multi-option kit. There's also a few other goodies thrown into that. Ooh, maybe uh, a little epoxy kit. stuff, maybe some yeah. finish kind of deal. Yep. That's telling it. you. So, uh, no better way to spend a Tuesday night than with us here go. in the penthouse. But Perfect. you know, we do have a really cool, um, it's been around for a couple weeks, maybe a month or so now, yeah. um, the virtual rod building classes. That's So, yeah. you know, we got to talk about these because of everything going on right now with the, the events. We've had to figure out a way to present rod building classes to people that want to learn the craft, right? Absolutely. But that's kind of hard to do in person right now, right? A little bit. Little so bit. we've introduced a new program called Virtual Rod, rod Building Classes. So um, I think we got a little clip on that. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Mudhole Custom Tackle is offering live virtual rod building classes with one of our rod building experts. Class sizes are limited to five participants to provide the highest quality of personalized instruction in HD video and create the best learning environment possible. Plus you get all the same tools and supplies as our in-person classes shipped right to your door. Learn rod building from the comfort of your own home. No travel or hotel accommodations necessary. Weekday classes include three daily sessions of two and a half hours per day, while weekend classes are split into two daily sessions of three and a half hours each day. Sign up today and find out how rewarding it is to catch a fish on a rod you built. Learn more at mudhole.com slash classes. And there you go. I think I recognize that guy at the end. Is that you? Handsome man. It's a pretty, pretty nice fish. I want to know how they got into my living room <laughs> while I was building fishing rods and they didn't notice. Yeah. Or I didn't notice. Um, well, you know, the great part about that is you get over $300 in parts and supplies. We send it right to your door. We know what you need. Mm -hmm. You get it. It's done virtually. We're talking taught by serious rod building professionals. You guys have seen we take the instructors that you would have live, whether it's Jesus or Cindy or Kurt Baker, or Todd here, we put them in front of a camera. It's one, it's not one-on-one, -on -one, but you have one-on-one -on -one questions. They can pull you aside virtually, tell you a little bit about it, show you a little deal there. I mean, we're talking over a hundred years in rod building expertise. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, I would say. And you can do this from your, life. you know, absolutely. And you can do this from your home too. You know, you can stay socially distanced from other people. Yep. The class sizes are small. They typically are around five people, yep. including an instructor. And most of these classes, there's more than one instructor at least listening in to the questions that can, you know, answer on the spot. So absolutely, it's, um, it's certainly, it's almost like you feel like you're in the same room without having to do that. So it's, it really is. It's a really a big advantage to, to take that right now. I think they are around 200 bucks, I believe. I think so. Yeah. yeah. And you can get... Um, like Chris said, it's over $300 in parts and supplies alone, so it's a no-brainer. Um, these instructors are really, really good. If you've taken an in-person class, Rob, uh, Rob been in class before, um, you know the reviews are outstanding. You know they put a lot of hard work into them, and exactly. the virtual classes are no different. So definitely take a look at that. Perfect. Now let's talk about some demo stuff. Let's do it. Let's get a power tool out. Let's talk reamers. We'll talk about. Uh, Walk me through, because you get the tape reamers in the famous FSB2 kit. Right. So you get a selection of these. And what the tape reamers do is they will help you go from, you know, a cork grip has a 250 ID. Almost 
all corks have a quarter inch, a 250 ID. Some have what, like a 300? Then we have a couple specialty grips that, that are even up to like 500, I think. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we're talking quarter inch IDs, and you gotta get that hole up to, you know, whatever rod blank you're gonna match. Of course, we all know that cork does not stretch. Uh, you can't do the mineral spirits and epoxy trick and slide it down like you can with EVA and wind grips, right. things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we supply y'all with what we call a tapering room. Right. It's a great base to start with. Yep. Especially, like you said, if you're reaming cork and you start with a 250, because with the extreme reamers, which we'll show in a second, mm -hmm. the small size and the, I think the extra small size, mm -hmm. we don't advise to use in a drill. Right. Because they are small diameter. The, um, the grit on them, the tape, the grit can, can come off easily with excessive heat. Right. So we advise against that. And of so, course, those, those fiberglass rods are a little, they're thinner, so that's exactly. what we want. Yep. We don't want the heat to. Uh, so to the get tape to those. reamers are a great starting point, especially with cork, you know, yep. like I said. Um, so you can use these, you can use these with any material. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's a great starting point. Um, I like to use the, the small and even the small medium. That is one advantage too, because they do come in the small, medium, and medium large. They have those half sizes that are right. in between, right? Yeah, so there's a bigger selection of tape reamers technically than yeah. of the extreme reamers. Right, so they're really good. And I especially love them on CFX grips too because as we've probably all been there before, if you have used the CFX grip or, and reamed one out, yep. you gotta go really slow. You, yes. you can't go too fast or else you'll just go right through it and all of a sudden, you know, you got a mess on your hands. So. Yeah, because that, the the interior of the CFX, it's it's partially, what makes it so light and also helps transmit some of that sensitivity from the blank. You know, it's, I don't remember exactly what they call it. We have it listed on the website, but that internal foam in there is, it's very strong, but it's very easy to ream. So it's something that you don't want to over ream and then have to arbor up. Right. So, um, you know, that's kind of one of their CFX, kind of one of their trade secret kind of deals. So you can easily get a little too aggressive with, uh, with the extreme reamer there. So the tape reamer on that is very good. Yep, so. absolutely. But like I said, it's a great starting point. You know, if you do want to come here with the small size or even like the medium size, come in, get a great starting point, ream it out to where you're close. Yep. And then you can come in if you'd like to show us. You know, this extreme reamer does come with a handle. Yep. So you can detach this and it is reverse threaded. I was just gonna say. Yep. If you guys uh, get these in and try to take the handle off and start turning it to your left and it does not come off, you gotta go to the right side. That's it. The old uh, righty tighty, lefty Lucy, right. it's opposite. So whoever Lucy's twin sister is, that's, that's how you go to the right yeah. or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, we, uh, reverse thread that so that it does not come off as you are reaming that into a grip. Exactly. Now, for the extreme reamers, um, it's, it is somewhat about placement because be careful when, be careful when you're putting this together and you are reaming this because some people like to go at it like this and hold it and ream it. Some people I see like to hold it like this and ream it. Um, what I would do is I would get you either a couple pieces of scrap cork um, and feel what works for you because when you are reaming this, running it wide open and you're getting very aggressive with it, you can actually ream it like this. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to ream it into an oval, right? Uh, the worst part is really with cork because the cork has no forgiveness. Right. Um, the EVA does have a little bit of forgiveness in it. What I do, and we've shown this with the crafty cutter before, uh, when, you're, when you're cutting into cork, do not force the extreme reamer into the grip, no matter if you're using EVA or cork or, or you know, CFX or anything like that. I, I like to 
get the drill moving and always keep it running whether you're going into the grip material or you're coming out of the grip material. Um, the reason for that is, is it won't, you know, lock up and grab on you. And, uh, you know, I think, I don't even remember what the phrase is, but it's, you know, you know, go fast and slow at the same time. So I run the drill wide open and then I go a little bit at a time. Right. So if I'm running this drill, I'm running it wide open the entire time and I'm going a little bit at a time, right? right? Because, you know, with, like I said, with an EVA or a wind that has EVA inside of it, you're able to take and ream it and get it close and then with a little bit of pro pace, you can, you know, finish the job per se, get right. it into place. With a cork, you can't do that because the cork won't stretch and you'll bust that cork. So, you know, with that, it's, it's just like, you know, measuring twice and cutting once. Um, another thing too is you might run into a situation where you run out of reamer thickness or, you know, the gauge of the reamer is not as large as where you need to get it on that rod blank. So what I tend to do if that is the case is I'm using the extreme reamer, running the drill wide open, and I'm going to tell you this and then I'm going to show you because it, sometimes it's a little hard to hear while I'm running the drill and talking at the same time. So I'm going to run the extreme reamer and I'm going to actually let go of the grip for a very split second and then grab it again as I technically I'm walking this grip around this reamer as I'm working it up and down the fiberglass uh, or the, the, you know, the grit. The reason for that is if you're moving the drill back and forth and you're holding the grip in one place, you will have a better chance of working it into an oval or an oblong. So right. I'm going to show you that here. I don't know if you can see that. I'll turn it this way too so you can see that material. So I'm technically walking that EVA around in a circular motion as the reamer is, you know, doing its job per se. So the reason for that is, is that will keep the opening in this grip, you know, as uniform and as circular as possible because you might not notice it here, right? So it might look all perfect and dandy and everything is great. The only issue is, is when you take a real seat and you arbor up the real seat and the real seat is perfectly squared off on the top and the bottom and you slide this grip down, you'll realize real quick if you are crooked on the grip. You know, you might look at it here and go, man, that's, that's perfect. But you start mating everything up and then your grip is like this and your real seat's like that and it's, ugh, it's a tough way to find out. So, Couple things, run that drill wide open. Um, don't stop the drill while you're working on the grip if you can help it so that it doesn't grab it and snatch it. Um, cork, that is the most important thing because otherwise you'll tear that cork really, really badly. You wanna sand the inside of the cork with the reamer. You're not wanting to tear at the inside of that cork. Right. So um, definitely go fast and slow at the same time. And then uh, whether you work horizontally or vertically, try to learn to articulate that grip around as you're using your, you know, as, as you're reaming at the same time. So you got a couple different movements going on, but, you know, practice it. it it'll be something that's really going to help, you know, tighten up your builds there. And of course, it's going to shave time off of using a tape reamer mm -hmm. and doing some things like that. Even though the tape reamer's got its place, especially in like a fly grip. For sure. Because those diameters are so small and you might only have to do just a little bit. The last thing you want is, especially in a fly rod, when you're, when you're not holding onto the real seat, you know, like you are on a spinning rod or something, all of the power is coming out of that grip. So, you know, if, you, if, <clears throat> if you're oblong in that grip or you've created an hourglass because you've reamed from this side, turned around, reamed from this side, and then the middle, you know, it's like that, 
Yeah. It's going to create a hinge point, and that's because you probably skipped a little time on your on your reamers and yeah. didn't take care to do that. And then, you know, your grip's going to walk on you. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Yep. Because when it comes to reaming, less is more in most cases. You definitely want to take your yeah. time with this. But, uh, but that is it. You're absolutely correct. The tape reamers have their place. They are a great starting point. But if you do want to be more efficient, shave some time off, knock out a set of five or ten grips, you know, and you can do them easily in five or ten minutes. Yeah. The extreme reamers chucked in a drill is definitely the way to go. Well, and two, you know, um, when you are doing, of course I got this, <laughs> all on my deal here. Took me four hours to do a cross wrap. Now well, that's a good point. You yeah. know, don't uh, don't ream your grips over your thread wraps. Exactly. And that'll save you a little time in the long See run. what I showed y'all there. <laughs> um, but another great tip when you are building multiples, whether you know if if you've got the Hunter McCamey line of flipping sticks, and you know exactly where that grip needs to be so that it slides down, take a piece of tape and run a piece of tape around that extreme reamer. So as you go and walk through the different extreme reamer sizes, maybe you start in the medium and then you just go to the large, run a piece of tape around that reamer. So you do one full stroke on one side and then you take the next one and you notice maybe you only need to go four inches up or five inches up and then you just make a mark and you just go right to the tape and you don't have to think about it. And those are these little things that, you know, some of the rod building geniuses here have shared with us. And then of course, you know, we've also made the mistakes. So we figure out how to fix those mistakes. So, yeah. you know, don't hesitate to tape off your reamers and uh, give, you a little, give yourself a depth gauge. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Benjamin's got a good question. How long does the extreme reamers last? Quite a while. Um, and I've, got also a, I've got an old set. Yeah, that it, I'm still it using. depends on how often you use, you use them, obviously. Yep. But I mean, hundreds and hundreds of grips. Um, oh, you yeah. know, and of course we do sell the the grit um, tape to replace yes. if you need to. But um, so yeah, you can re grit them. Is that the right? <laughs> re -grit? In, instead of re grip, you can re grit them. Yes, we do sell that roll and. Uh, you know, you would, you could pro paste it. You could contact them in it, something like that. I would uh, probably pro paste or pro glue it back on there, and you just line it up and wind it around. It'll pretty much tell you when it's worn out because uh, I can't remember which size of mine wore out first. I think it was the medium. Probably the medium. And it's just because that's the one that catches the most mileage. And what you'll notice is, for example, everything here is very uniform. What you'll notice is, is you'll, you'll start to lose adhesion on like one or two of these wraps. And you can still use it, but you'll notice that you'll lose it and then this will jump down here and it'll be, a little, it'll be a little oblong. But because it's wrapped, it doesn't typically come completely undone all at once. Right. So you'll notice it get a little wonky in like one little section. And to be honest, I just keep using it. But <laughs> it did get to the point where it did get a little bit loose. And then what I did is I just went through and peeled it off and put a new section. But I think it was the medium. Because this, this little one, you'll wear it out real fast if you put it in a drill, which, again, we say not to do. <laughs> right. So, yep. Uh, Ronald's got a good question. You, uh, you answered most of this. How do you ream wind grips and uh, keep the hole centered? So you, you touched on that quite a bit. Um, I will say wind grips, the, the inside of a wind grip, uh, where's the one you just had? Right there on the end. Yep. Um, they are just EVA on the inside. That's all it is. There's nothing special inside of that. It's just an EVA material. So you would do it the same way you would EVA, cork, et cetera. You can use a tape reamer. You can chuck uh, your extreme reamer in a drill mm -hmm. and use that as well. So uh, nothing really special there, but the technique is really what comes into play and, and yep. to make that hole not too out of balance. So. Exactly. Speaking of being out of balance, uh, we have a very technical term here when we are reaming a closed in fighting butt. I believe, uh, I believe your dad used the term. I know my father used the term, mm -hmm. being from the South. Yep. Uh, the very technical rod building term is called wallering. <laughs> so this is the when the MHX version of the wind grip, it is a closed-in butt, right?
right? right? So you cannot take a reamer and you cannot go through this. Well, you can, but you got to, you know, drill a hole in here, ream it out, then you got to find a way to plug yeah, it. Yeah, extra work. Yeah, just extra work. So, what I have done, and you can do this with cork or you can do this with EVA. Now, I'm going to just handhold this one here just to show you. So, this is just straight in, right? So this size is not going to do a whole lot if you think about it in this manner. It's, it's not going to do a whole lot if you try to go in and out because, you know, I'm it, it barely touching the sides, right? right? But if you tilt this a little bit, right, and technically you go in like this, and again, this is very exaggerated, I understand that. So you go in like this and you turn this and you're actually going to walk it around the outside. So imagine this is stuck here in the center and it's pivoting like this, right? This is textbook wallering, right? <laughs> so you're going to work that, that, the grip around like that. Now, what I tend to do is I tend to open up um, this part, which I guess for lack of a better term, we'll call the mouth because it's here at the front, okay. right? So I tend to get this part to the size of the rod blank first. That's mm -hmm. the first, the first step. And again, you know, we're measuring, we're checking, we're doing, you know, okay. So once we get that, then I actually put it in straight like mm -hmm. this. And I go and I kind of articulate the grip around, right? So what we've done is we've opened up this first part of the diameter, right? Opened up this so it'll, it'll fit on the end of the rod blank. Now, it's probably not going to slide all the way on. It's definitely not if it's cork. Right. But <clears throat> it probably is not going to slide all the way on even if it's WIN or EVA because you've created like a triangle here. So it's wide at this end and then it tapers down to whatever the opening was in there. So then what we're going to do is we're going to use the smaller reamer and go in and out as we're spinning the grip. So now we're sanding the inside and we're shaving that off. So as it goes around, we're now going to take what is a cone and open it up like this. Now the good thing is, is this will stretch. Correct. So as you do that, you don't technically have to get it exactly to the same diameter. Yeah. What will help do the rest is the propase. Right. So the propase is actually going to, you put a little in there, put on the rod blank, and it sort of becomes you know, a, a lubrication type thing where you can get it onto the butt of the rod blank and spin the rod blank and spin the wind grip, and it will actually force its way in there. Now, what you do not want to do is do not put your rod blank in this, especially EVA, because EVA is bad about this. Do not put, let me grab this, do not, and of course this is much smaller than this would go on here. Do not put your rod blank in here like this. And if you notice, I always check it. So I always will like mark it, or if I get it, to go on as far as I think, I will typically, especially with cork, especially with this, while you're trying to get everything coated in epoxy, I will check the depth and go like this and go, okay, well that's all, all the way in. Because sometimes you might put it in and if you check the depth and you go like this, you're like, ooh, that's, that's only halfway down. We get those photos a lot with somebody with a fighting butt that snapped off and they're like, how did that happen? Well, the rod blank didn't get all the way to the base. Right. <clears throat> what you do not want to do, though, if you cannot get this thing to seat all the way, do not, with EVA or WIN, do not put your rod blank in it and put it on the counter or the floor and do one of these numbers. If you do one of these numbers, you will end up punching a hole in the bottom of your grip. And it happens very easy, it happens very fast, and you just ruined a $9 grip. Yep. So don't do that. So tips and tricks and don'ts and do's and don't do that. This is fixable. 
just don't do it. Not okay? ideal. It's not ideal because when you do that and it, you know, it blows out that backside, it's, it's all craggly and messed up. And it's not like you took a perfect little hole and, and drilled it in there. It, it really messes it up. So, because what will happen is the end of that rod blank will actually act like a hole punch. And it'll punch a hole in any of these EVA grips. Yep. So, don't do that. So, there you go. Great. A couple little tips and tricks on wallering. Great demo there. I like that one a lot. Uh-huh. All right. Well, let's do... Let's see. If we have any questions... Yes, we do. A um, little off topic. Let's hit this one though. Chris, um, the epoxy part is starting to crystallize. Is it still good? So Chris, at, and this can vary depending on, but it's usually temperature that affects epoxy. And when it starts to crystallize or go to like a solid form, mm -hmm. this especially happens with the resin. But you can just pop that bottle into the microwave for 10, 12 seconds at the most. Right. And usually, almost every single time that uh, the crystallized part will actually just turn back into a liquid and you're good to go. The epoxy is just fine. And you might have to do it, like you said, 10 to 12, you know. Even less, maybe, maybe start at five. Maybe. Well, but what I'm saying is, is you might have to do it a couple times. Right. You know, like do it for eight or 10, 12, whatever, look at it, go, well, no, that's not enough yet. Go back in for another eight or 10. Don't do it once and then go, well, that's not enough, and put it in there for 30. Right. Don't do that. Yeah. Little yeah. at a time, little at a time. You can do that also with propaste mm -hmm. as well because sometimes the, uh, what is it? Is it the resin or the hardener? It's usually the resin that it happens with. You can also do this in, yeah, in, the resin, in, the blue bo bottle. in boiling water, you know, on your yep. stove top. Don't get, you know, bubbling boiling. No. But mm -hmm. it just needs to be hot and you can dunk in the bottle for just a few seconds. Yeah. And just do it like you know, like I said, five to ten seconds at a time, um, or else you'll start messing with the, the the bottle, the plastic bottle, or you know anything like that. So. Yep. And also, do not mix them and then put them in the microwave. <laughs> right. Don't do that either. Do just what the resin, right? Do yeah. just the resin. Put it in there, five seconds, eight seconds, whatever. So. So let's answer this one. Okay. Because this is reamer related. Okay. Mark, what is the best way to clean the reamers? Um, Mark, I, I don't clean them with anything. I actually will, so this one has some EVA, just stuff on it, right? I either, if I'm working with it, or if I'm done with this one, I actually, if I have a rod building bench in my garage, because I don't rain inside the house. It's one of those, like, don't put finish on your grandmother's <laughs> antique dining room table. Don't ream in the house. Right. Okay? So if you've got this on here, it's very scientific. I take it, and I just go like <laughs> that on the side of my workbench. Oh, look at that. It's clean. It's clean. The reason I say that is I don't recommend putting anything on the reamer because it's going inside the grip that could contaminate or scratch or cause your finish not to set or, you know, I don't know. Like, I just, I don't want somebody to be like, oh yeah, you know, I use WD-40 or I, I, I don't know, I don't know what you would possibly use, but I don't want, you know, anything on these reamers except for the dust of the previous grip or nothing at all because I just don't want to put a solvent on here that could damage something or something that might put residue on the inside of the very next grip that I do that could cause the adhesion to change, or I don't know. Just, I just knock them off on the side of my workbench or tap them on the top or whatever, but they don't, they don't need to be like, you know, really reamed because you're not gonna see the inside of the grip. If there's a little bit of EVA in that cork from the last grip you reamed, it's not, it's not gonna hurt anything, trust me. Exactly. So, cool, cool. Easy enough. All right, well there you have it. Little EVA, little cork reaming, little wallering. Let's give something away, how about that? Third place giveaway. All right, who we got? Let's see, so our third place giveaway is gonna be a extreme reamer set from yeah. CRB. Huh? And that's gonna go to uh, Shane Seal. 
Shane Seal, congratulations. Nice. You have a set of Extreme Rumors headed your way soon. Perfect. I love them. I really do. What is, don't we have a box? Let's show yeah. them what it comes in. Right here. Perfect. So cool. in there you get the different sizes and then you get one of the handles. Let's right? go back this way. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, there we go. A little there better picture the there. old Hunter Baton twirl. <laughs> right. Got him. Playing a little tag. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, they come in this convenient tube, and obviously, if I were you, I'd reuse this. I'd hang on to it. Yeah. Yep. I'd keep this. You know, you can ditch the, uh, the, the plastic packaging inside, but I would keep the tube. Mm -hmm. It's super easy just to uh, stow those away. They don't have to be on your rod bench and, yep. you know, cause a little extra chaos. So. Yep. Perfect. Congratulations, Shane. All right, so what are we going to talk about now? Because it is a little bit of a newer product. It is. Right? We and, yeah. went over the benefits on the last. So let's, let's show it in action. Do you so want me to move this guy here? Um, if you want to, maybe just a yeah, little. Yeah, I can set it down. So move this over here. So, we talked about this a little bit on the last show, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about specifically this guy right here, the two spool version. But we also have the four spool version tonight. So, these are amazing. Yep. So, our first hand wrapper, the HWS one, was incredible too. But these guys right here, the two spool and the four spool, there's significant upgrades on these two pieces of equipment that make wrapping so much easier. It's just, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's one of those things you have to really, you gotta pick one up and you gotta use it. There's the, um, the tension is much smoother. You know, we have the upgraded um, caps on both sides, the knobs, right? That have built in um, ball bearings, as well as, these spool retainers on each side of your spool, whether you have 100 yard spools, whether you have the one ounce medium spools, mm -hmm. it can work for both. And of course, we have the, um, you know, the spacers there, depending on what size spool you wanna use. Yep. We have the same knobs on the stands themselves on both sides. Mm -hmm. So that gives you, you know, they also have the springs and the washers on there, so you can dial in, um, you know, if you wanna, you know, you can move these a little bit in, you can move them out, depending on what kind of rods you're working with. Yeah, because right? I mean, based on what are, where your guide space, guide spacing is at, you might have to slide this one in, slide this one out, so you get everything centered, yep. right? So you can, you know, whoop, these are, you know, they can move back and forth. These are actually tightened down a pretty decent amount, yeah. but they still allow you to move them back and forth with these, right? Perfect. We have the eye bolts in the middle, the triangle there, depending on whether what spool you want to use, and you can also go straight to the middle if you need to. Yep. We still have the slider built in, right? It's there. Um, and one of the coolest features, I'm going to tilt this up just a little bit so you can see, is we have two insets, one on each side, that allow you to put little parts and pieces, whether it's your micro guides, your rod bands, you know, the little um, little ovals that can be easily missed or misplaced. Oh, for sure. You can set those right in there. Um, you don't have to worry about them going anywhere. Might be a hook keeper, you know, small little items that tend to, if they get dropped on the floor, they might be gone forever. Oh, yeah, So you for can sure. keep them right there. Excellent. So that's a two-spool version. We talked about that on the last show. But one thing we didn't show is the four spool version, right? Mm -hmm. I'll slide this over here. So the four spool, four spool version is probably my favorite. And a couple of benefits, you know, obviously right away. We have all the same uh, cool features, the knobs, the, uh, the spool retainers with ball bearings, you still got your tension rod, but the ability to have four spools, that's a question that comes up very often. Why would I need to have four spools, right? So let's say you're building two or three rods in, in one night. One rod's gonna have blue thread, one's gonna have black, one's gonna have gray. You can go ahead and load up all your thread spools into this carriage and have it ready to go. And you can also have your metallic thread waiting. And there's nothing worse than having your spool of thread sitting on your table and you go to pick it up, maybe you drop it 
and it was the thread was loose, the tagging was loose, and all of a sudden you got thread everywhere. Absolutely, it hits the floor and then it rolls yeah. that way and it keeps going, and now you're just and like, now cool, it's gone that, down the hall. It's, that that yeah. hundred yard spool just turned into about sixty five. So what this allows you to do is not only wrap with different colors, you can also you know say you wanted to do two colors of metallics, you can have those ready to go at any time, and you can just simply you know pull your tag in off, pull some thread off, and you're good to go. There's no worrying about stripping off thread and you know having to worry about it falling or getting misplaced yep. so and of course you know for those that love the tension rod still incorporated into the four spool advanced hand wrap right you know because that's something that if you want to use this in standalone form like i kind of still do at the mm -hmm. house i just don't have a lot of room to power wrap but you can still use the tension rod and then of course don't we have a system where if you want to run this over to the track, exactly. all you got to do is on yep. the bottom there, you'll just take and you will throw in, there are three at the top and three at the bottom, those pre-drilled holes, that is for your ball bearing system. Yep. So that ball bearing system will made up with the RBS Pro track run it right on there. You can take these rod stands off and then you can use the rod stands on the track and you're ready to rock. Exactly. You know? And there are, we didn't really highlight, but there are, um, you know, the, these black pads on the bottom. Yeah. So when you do, if you use this, this hand wrapper alone on your desk, there's no worry about it moving side to side, yep. you know, because sometimes you are moving your rod, moving the, the stands and the, the ties on each side. No, did I leave it on this one? No, I took Those them off. off too. That's well, okay. I was using them on the track, so. Right. But it allows you this, to keep this wrapper stable at all times and not have to worry about it moving all over the place, right? Right, for sure. Yep. And one thing, too, that's really overlooked is we do have two sets of notches on the rod stands, which also, you know, it just gives you better ability to, you know, if a rod is, uh, whether you're doing saltwater rods or fly rods or inshore rods, all of these blanks have different diameters, so you can really adjust to whatever diameter you're working with and really lock that rod in. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's it. We, um, we might be giving one away here in a little bit, so make sure you guys stay tuned. Yeah, probably. Why not? It's on your credit card. Yeah, might as well, know. right? I don't know what else to tell you. So you've got that guy. Got that guy. Now, speed it up a little bit. We'll get the power tool out, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right. <clears throat> Which I made you take it down. Sorry about that. Hey, we're good here. Looks like you're unveiling it now, you know? Kind of, yeah. Take your tape bringer back. All right, so we have the RBS Pro Power Wrapper here. Um, I've got a cutoff section of blank here loaded in. Uh, I want to show you a couple things with all of my EVA shavings. So... What we've got is kind of the cousin to the advanced hand wrapper, right? This is going to be our, what is this, the TC4 we call that? TC4. TC4. All right, cool. RBS TC4. The RBS TC4. So <clears throat> just like with that one, we got four spools. We, I only have the one color loaded up here because that's the one I'm going to use and I'm going to show you. But the great thing is, is we've got, our, you know, multiple eyelets. We've got magnets in this one. So you can take, right here, here we go. So we got magnets in this one, right? Hold your uh, razor blade there. You do have your inset here with a magnet in it, put all your guides in it. And of course, on the bottom here, we've got our rollers. Now the difference in the TC4 is I run it just in one track. So you can see it's just three here. I just run it in one track right here in front of me, right? So this thing's gonna glide up and down here. And I use the power wrapper if we're doing an over wrap on a dragon scale. If we're doing a long under wrap under, you know, heavier offshore stuff. Because whereas <clears throat> the hand wrapper is great for you know some tight work and when you're learning and if you don't have room for this. But I can't tell you, I mean, now granted, if you want like the best forearm workout you've ever had in your whole life, 
take and do really long under wraps like this on a hand wrapper. You can do it, but again, you're going to be there for a minute. And in the process of doing, let's say, production rods, and you want to do four that are matching, and I've told you guys this before, I put all my grips on, all four rods, set them aside, let them dry. I'll come back, I will do all four, whether it's a butt wrap, whether it's under wraps, I do all of that together. And most of the time, I put a very thin coat of finish on my cross wrap or decorative work, whatever you might want to do, whether you're doing a chevron or you know, diamonds or crosses or, or fish or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll do a very thin coat here. In the meantime, I do the thin coat here and I do the thin coat on each one of my under wraps all the way down the rod. Then that's where I bring in the three rod dryer because I put it all on and I go to that one. And I put it all on and I go to that one. So each stage I'm completing one step at a time and that's gonna help speed you up. The reason for that is <clears throat> if you put on a handle and then you change over, do a cross wrap, and then do your under wraps, and then you change over and do your guide wraps, and then you change over and you do your finish, you're wasting time in all of your changeovers, right? So if you do everything one step at a time, so all your handles, all your cross wraps, all your under wraps, you know, you minimize your changeover, you minimize wasting time. Right. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to cut out some time. Now, because we all like to see a little bit of wrapping, I am going to show how to do the final little touches here on this cross wrap. And I'm going to show you how to do it using the RBS Pro, and I'm going to walk you through doing it on the RBS Pro, showing you how to do an under wrap, and then I'm going to put a little finish on it to kind of end it, right? So I've got the, this is a Pro Wrap Metallic size D 9710. So this is a, uh, this is like a copper type color, 9710 size D, kind of a cool copper color, right? I am also using, uh, I'm also using, the Pro Wrap Braid. This is just the 10 card or the 10 yard card. So this is the purple that I'm using here. Uh, it's it's just you can see it. It throws down a really wide stripe, and not only does it have a cool effect, but it also helps throw a wide stripe if you're not doing individual colors. Um, the interior here on this one is two of the copper. I lay multiples down, it helps widen kind of your gap there and it helps them stand out. Now, if you notice though, this might kind of sort of blend in a little bit, right? You know, you got a black or a slate blank and then you got a couple dark colors. So for all of those that have shown, for all the times we've shown it, I want to show it again. And <clears throat> always be sure to border your wrap a little bit of tape, I go around once, turn it around on itself, and we're gonna throw down so that it's sticky side out, right? I'm gonna do it down here too. Just go around once, turn it around, sticky side out. So now I have white. This is, uh, this is actually 805. So, because we do have a few different whites. We got like- we do four or five whites now. Yeah, crazy. Quite, quite a few. So this is 805, uh, it's just the one I grabbed uh, in size D because the braid is fairly thick and I'm using size D in the metallic. There's no real right or wrong here. You can use like all size A or all size D or all size B, whatever. So I will pull off a section. I usually do, you know, full arm's length because remember we're gonna go down and back. Um, you don't wanna, run out halfway down or halfway back and it's fairly inexpensive so we're going to just pull off all that we need right so what we're going to do is i'm going to start it by going around so now this is stuck right and the reason that i hang on 
Should have cut that off for you all. Sorry about that. So the reason that I like doing these cross wraps on an RBS Pro is there's ball bearings inside this housing. So I can easily take my hand and go forward this way and back up this way and go forward this way and back up. And it's very, very smooth. But when you leave the band on, I actually have the V band here. This is the fiber V band because it comes with two. This band has enough tension that I can actually, I can pull on this pretty good. So if you've got the braid and you want to stretch that braid a little bit or you want to pull on this pretty good, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to back the rod blank off and you're going to lose it and it's going to backlash on you. But with pretty ease on the turn of the hand, you can walk this around and it really makes pretty quick work of it. You know, when you are running it on the RBS Pro, it really makes pretty quick work of it. So I'm just going to go down and back here. And the reason I'm showing you guys with white is because it, there's a dark blank. And it really, I want to show you the difference in real time, what it will show. because it's really going to make this pop. Now if I had like a seafoam color blank maybe, or a light blue or, or something like that, I would use, you know, a, a solid black thread in color fast, which the solid black is uh, 862, right? Correct. Yeah. We know that because that's what all of our guide wraps are. <laughs> exactly. But uh, so you would use that to offset the colors rather than white. Might be close. You going for it? Yeah, why not? Now, of course, I'm kind of sort of you guys don't realize it, but when we were talking about, yeah, that's not going to work. That's yeah, not going to be enough. But the good thing is, I noticed it's not going to be enough before I finished it. So, I'll just take a piece. Now, what you guys don't know is, I started the epoxy mixer while we were talking. And the epoxy mixture has been turning, and I'm going to have finish ready by the time that I'm done with this. And Hunter is going to be stuck stirring his finish, and I'll probably be done putting finish on my section before his finish is even mixed. So that's going to be your saving time tip. Yeah. All right. So there is, there's what it looks like now with the white. You can really see where the white has outlined it. And you just come back in here, tighten some things up. Um, I wouldn't say it's too sloppy. It's pretty good. That looks good. I worked kind of quick, but you know, people got hot pockets to eat. They can't be watching me do cross wraps all night. So <clears throat> Just go back through with your burnishing tool, and there you have it. Now, uh, that is, <clears throat> that's going to make your cross wraps much easier in the RBS Pro. Now, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like after. Oh, actually, yeah, I'll take that off. Let's do, go ahead and put that out there. Is that this? Swap <clears throat> that, yep, because I'll use that here in just a second. So, through the magic of television. I've got one that I've already finished. Same colors. And I went through and blocked them off. So do we have one of those bands? Was, that, was there one of those yeah, bands there on there? was. What did you do with your four wrapper? I just took it. Oh, OK. There's one right down there. All right, so we've got 
Thank you. All right, so we've blocked it off. I use just you know the black color fast that I was telling you about on either side here, but you can really see I actually widened the internal. I went to four strands at one time, which four strands of metallic is a little tougher than I thought it would be. Uh, two strands is about perfect. The four was the four was a little much, but so did black on either side, ran it, and we did purple. So let's fast forward, and I'm going to show you guys about using the TC4 to run an under wrap. This question came up earlier in the day, and we talked about starting a wrap. Now, some of us, you know, when I first was learning, I would take it, and you go around the rod blank, and you go the direction that you're going to wrap. Right. Because you're going to take this standing line and wrap it over the top of this tag end, and that's what's going to lock it down, right? So it's going to go over the top of it, and you can actually spin it here and kind of get it to where you know they're together. And then you have to start this, right? Get it going, and then we start it. Of course, Adam's got to put the band back on. So that is how I got it started back you know, when I was first starting out. Now, it's a, it's a good way to do it. Sometimes, though, it won't catch that time it caught, right? But <clears throat> what you can do, and what I have started doing as of a few years ago, is I actually go around twice. Now, I've even gone around three or four times, depending on the finish of the blank. It seems like the gloss blanks kind of grab a little bit, whereas the satin black, like on an NEPS, it seems like that there's, it's like nonstick or something. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like a Teflon frying pan or something. It's it, slick. It, it's much slicker. Even mm -hmm. though it looks like there's a texture to it, it, it's much slicker. So I actually take it and we will go around once, twice, right? You can go around again, but just make sure you're going the direction you're going to be wrapping, right? So then what you're going to do is you're going to take this standing line, you're going to go over the top, and I tend to go, you know, once or twice around. Just what it will do is it will tighten those bands up because they'll be like, you know, the, the bands will be like this, and as you spin it, they'll kind of tighten up, right? So then what you can do is you can go around, and now you're pretty much locked. That's pretty tight in there. Then if we're going to wrap an under wrap, we are going to, I got cords and stuff down here. So we're going to use the power wrapper, right? And by now you're probably feeling that cramp in your forearms if you're using a hand wrapper, like I have so many times. And of course you can run this thing pretty wide open. This really does a pretty good job of, of moving with it. I don't tend to just let it go. Um, I, I do help guide it at times. Uh, what you can do then is pull you off a piece here if you have it. But again, take this, put it in your four spool. Because the second that you drop this... It's gone. Mm, <laughs> I'm telling you what. I have... I have whew, if you've got little kids at home, you will teach them some things that they shouldn't say as soon as you drop that metallic thread. So you can take it filter in your piece there. We'll do a couple wraps. Lock that down. We want to do an inlay, which I like to do sometimes. You always take this piece of metallic, go behind the purple that you're wrapping with. Now the metallic is first, the purple is second. And then I'm going to hand turn this because I'm just not that good to do it under power, right? So now I'm laying down <clears throat> an inlay where you're looking at a metallic thread next to a purple thread. We'll do that however many times and we'll get back to where we started. Go back underneath. 
pull it tight. Now we've locked that metallic again. Then we can go back to the fun part, run the power wrapper a few times. Cut it. And of course, you've got, you know, these marked off exactly how long you need to do your, you know, for your under wrap for your guide. And of course, we get the question a lot, what size thread do you do on an under wrap? I try to use A as much as I can unless I forgot to order size A or I forgot to pick it up or whatever. I have found, to answer a question we had earlier today, I actually like putting finish on my under wraps. The reason I do that is for me, putting finish on is, is not a very time consuming task for me. I know for some people it, it can be time consuming, um, but for me, I would rather put a very thin coat of finish on every under wrap, come back, it helps me speed up my guide wraps. So it helps me move faster when I'm over wrapping, right. I guess would be the term. Right? Yeah. So I'm gonna move this TC4 and I'm actually going to grab a wide brush. So most of the time you will see me or Hunter will finish with these little quarter inch guys, right? So this is just, you know, the, uh, this is an ox hair brush. So this is just rod building ox hair brush. They come in a couple different. There's this one. There are some red sables, right? Yeah, red sable. They look like this. So the red sable is one as well. Um, when you have these, I recommend getting some of the brush cleaner. That way, you know, you don't have to throw them away if you don't want to. I mean, they are, the ox hair ones are pretty inexpensive. The red sables are more expensive. Um, but then that way you don't have to throw them away. So just kind of a, you know, I forget which one we have here. We have the U40 here, brush cleaner. Brush cleaner. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple other ones too, right? Yep. So I just put a little of that in a cup, put it in there. The brushes can actually live in there. It's not going to damage. If you leave it in the brush cleaner, it's not going to damage it. Now, for the uh, applying finish with, with the power wrapper. Uh, if you get really, really brave, you can finish, you know, under power uh, using the pedal, using the band, yeah. something like that. Um, but I actually like to do something, and I'll show you here in a minute, because I don't want to get too far away from the giveaway. Yeah, we gotta do a giveaway, right? Because we need to give away that advanced hand wrapper. We do. So now that we're done wrapping, before I move to the finish, I wanna make sure we give something away. Yeah, we got a runner up giveaway, because we did mention the four spool uh, advanced hand wrapper that we we're gonna give away. So let's, uh, let's get to that real quick. And we do have a winner, Tony Miller. <clears throat> Coming from, out of YouTube. From YouTube, we'd love to see that. Nice. We have a... Uh, you know, our, our YouTube uh, following is starting to, to gain a little bit. It's getting big. Yeah, YouTube is, uh, it's really, it's a little bit more convenient maybe to watch than, than I Facebook think so. sometimes. Yeah, so. you know, I, I believe the quality is a little bit better right. because we run pretty high here. I mean, on the, on the quality, we've got the cameras turned way up. We've got the high speed going. Uh, it seems like Facebook knocks it down a little, but I do notice that some guys and girls are whether they're watching in the man cave or they got the TV in the she shed, you know? <laughs> right. um, they're watching it on the big screen over the rod building bench. Super cool. In the she shed or the, or the man cave. Yeah. So they can run YouTube through there and, uh, and it's pretty cool. And then of course you can still interact with us live. And as always, if you can't join us because you know, you gotta work or you got other obligations or uh, you know, even though, I, I mean, we got people that watch us in Australia live. So they're getting it done, but we do archive it. 
So it is archived in YouTube or Facebook. Right. So congratulations coming out of YouTube. Now, let's talk about finish. Okay. Because we all know and love you know, the RDS systems. We've got them with a clutch now. Uh, we've got them with the, uh, the clamp thing. That is, that's great when you're using you know, for a fly rod or something like that. Now, I'm not discounting any of the RDS systems, and I'll tell you why. When I put any finish on in the way I'm going to show you right now, it's not around guide feet, delicate guide feet. It's not trying to cut <clears throat> a really sharp edge and be very careful. This for me is about speeding up, putting a lot of finish. That, and I don't mean a lot of finish with a thick finish. I mean a lot of coverage. Right. So we're looking at, you know, we're looking at acres here rather than rather than thickness, right? So we need to cover a lot of surface area with a thin layer of finish so we can move on to the next rod to get it in the tri dryer or the quad dryer you got hanging on the wall so we can get to the next one to the next one to the next one so by tomorrow when those are dry we can come back and we can do guide wraps on all these and then after we do guide wraps on all the rods now we got four rods with guides that are ready to put finish on them and I might come in put a little finish on put it in that dryer, do some touch-ups. But around, you know, really, really small guide feet and stuff like that, I still have to use a regular RDS. Right. Running at 9, running at, you know, 18 RPM. Either one, I've got to use that one because I cannot be as delicate around small guide. And I do drop back to the smaller brush. Go back to the smaller brush. You've seen it. I always cut it, um, trim it down a little. I, even, I did trim this ox hair one down just a little bit because there were some flyers. There was a cow lick in that one. So um, Anyway, I cheated a little bit. I was going to say, you know, I, I got the epoxy out here. I was ready to mix a batch. Oh, yeah, you can knock yourself out there. But, but. You, you're, that, you're a step ahead of me. I saw you started it earlier in the it. show. Now. Which is, um, sorry to cut you off there, but no, it's, no, no, it's yeah. a great example of kind of the set it and not necessarily forget it, but save it for later, right? Absolutely. So you, you started this, what, 10, 15, 20 minutes ago mm -hmm. and sitting there, and I guarantee you can take that out right now and you're good to go. You can start your, you know, applying your epoxy. Absolutely. But for me, I'm still stuck here. I got to mix my batch and That's I, I'm not ready yet, so. Yeah, and again, we're saving five minutes here, five minutes there. It's just one of, it's just one of those deals that over the course of rod builds, you could save yourself an hour right. if you save it five minutes here, five minutes there, type thing. Nick, what is it, bud? Oh, right. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. So what we've got is, if I'm using the RDS system and the small dryer, and I want to extend my finish time, I'm typically going to pull out the foils, right? Yep. So if I don't pull the foils out, um, I don't always use the foil when I'm doing, you know, longer stretches like this, but I'll show you anyway with the foils. So what we've got is out of the dryer here, I'll turn it off. Will you hand me one more of those, please? Sure. Because I need to put this weight. The foil? Yeah, see the foil under there? Yeah. All right, so coming out of the epoxy mixer, is ready to rock. Now, remember we've got this weight in here. What I would typically do is take you some alcohol, brush cleaner, something that you would use to clean epoxy off with, put this guy in a cup like this rather than out in this dish. Okay? That'll just clean it up. It'll be ready to rock for later. You can take and use one of these foils. This is the foil three. I'm actually going to put it in here. Okay. I'm going to use the back side of this brush to take care of it. I think they got you on the manual focus now. 
You ready for that? I'm not necessarily ready, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Turn around. Let me see it. Yeah. You're on manual. Let me hang on real quick. I'll fix it for you. Okay. It's this switch right here. All right. Now all you got to do is do the half tap, and you're ready to rock. All right. So I've got finish in the dish, mixed up, ready to rock. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the band off okay. of here, right? So right now with the band on, we could turn this. And technically, I could put finish on. You know, if you have a pretty steady foot, you could run it up. You know, nothing that's too crazy, right? You could do it like that. Now, got a little. All right, but if you don't want to run it by foot, pull this band off, and the resistance becomes very, very little. The reason for that is, is there's ball bearings inside of here, so you can actually take this, right? We're gonna put it on. And I think all my talking probably let this go a little longer than it should have. That still looks good. Yeah. But remember, I can go this way. I can turn it back this way. I can actually move it pretty quickly because I want to do pretty clean coverage pretty quickly. And remember, as long as you keep this moving, you're not going to have any issues with it setting up on you. And again, I'm not cutting any super sharp edges here, right? All I'm doing is getting it going. Now, and you can, you do have time just to let it go just for, you know, a few seconds while you load that brush back up. And if you want it to spin at you, you can spin at you like this. Make sure we're good to go there, right? And then what you would do is you would come out to your under wrap, move out here. And we'll just work. Because remember, this is going to be covered so don't sweat having your perfect edges, right? Now remember, if, if you're going to be doing a lot of these, make sure you've got more than, because what I did is I mixed three cc's of each, right? And you can see I'm running a little short, but it's not too bad. All right, so then we're done there. Take this out. Which one you got? You, uh, which one you got me plugged into? I got the bottom one right here. All right. I need another rod stand. Yeah. That was the closest. Oh, you got the triple. Oh. Yep. Sorry about that. Wasn't thinking. Okay, ready? Ready, baby. All right. All right, cool. So. As you finish each one of them, imagine we're doing a whole rod here. So knock the whole rod out, then it goes into the lower dryer, and then you would come over, pull your next one. Imagine this one was completely done. You go through and do that one, completely done. And you'll also learn how much finish it takes on, you know, whatever. 
For example, I know that I can pull three cc's of each and do all, you know, a regular casting rod, a regular fly rod, things like that. Exactly. <clears throat> you know, I think on the last larger build I did, <clears throat> it was five cc's per rod that was over a cross wrap and over all the under wraps, about. Gotcha. So that is about that. Now, got some questions here. Don't worry, we were not ignoring y'all. We were just walking y'all through the steps. I want to answer this question. Antonio had a great question. And welcome, since it's the first time on the series. And I saw he's building a shark rod. Yeah. I'm building a shark rod. Because <laughs> we're going to go try to catch some sharks at night coming up here in a couple weeks. His question is on epoxying the under wrap first before roller guide using size D thread. Again, if you're using size D as an under wrap, I would put finish on it. Now I told you I put finish on no matter I'm using A or D, but as you know, rod building rule on under wraps is you want to use size A as an under wrap and then size D as an over wrap. The reason is, is if you flip flop them and you use D on an under wrap and A on the top, a is obviously thinner than size D, and it will cut in between the size D threads. Whereas if size A is laid down, and let's say you know this is the size of the four threads of A, and size D is twice the width, it's not going to work itself in between and spread those apart. So, you know, again, if you don't have size A and you don't have size D, um, put finish on, but again, I always put finish on. Very, very thin coat. I'm talking like the coat, you can almost see the ridges in the thread. You know, like when you put a guide wrap on and you put finish and you don't put enough finish. Right. You see those thread ridges, that's completely okay on an under wrap. Uh, and that's about as thin as I use it. You know, I use the Pro Coat regular, that's a medium build, or I use the Threadmaster Light for that. And then come back if you want that high build look while uh, so many offshore guys love, use the high build from Pro Coat right. as your top coat. You can mix and match those. You can put regular build down first, you know, the medium build first, put high build over the top. Now the, remember the working times are different, so you right. gotta understand <clears throat> that, but you can stack them like that and change it. So yeah. that is a, it's a great question there. I just saw that, I saw a shark. That's a good one, that's a really good one. Uh, David, do you need to hit that with heat? Referring to the um, <clears throat> the uh, epoxy that Chris just laid down, it's always a great idea to to flame or hit your uh, your epoxy with some heat. That's going to release the air bubbles. It's going to level the finish. Uh, it's always a good idea to do that. I always do. Um, and if you could see that up close, so you yeah, there there's there's several bubbles in there for <laughs> sure. But, um, but yeah, it's always a good idea to do that. It does not hurt. Um, especially if you're doing, you know, a thin coat, it'll help push some of that epoxy to the side and, and really get that uh, leveled out. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cody, how long can you let the mixer uh, mix epoxy before it starts to react? Um, well, I think Chris kind of noticed there was about maybe 20 minutes or so. I would not 20, let it go. 25 minutes. I wouldn't yeah. let it go longer than that. No, I mean, you're, yeah, I would probably start to, to try to use it with at least maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, yeah. Once you go over 15 to 20, 30 minutes, uh, it, it, it will start to slowly set up. Um, so yeah, you wanna probably start within 10 to 15 minutes. And it just doesn't flow as easy, you know? I mean, if you had to do something or you were transitioning from one step to the next, that's when I would, you know, go ahead and put it on the epoxy mixer as you then you know, maybe turn around and get you a brush, trim the brush a little, or, or get you some paper towel, or, yeah. you know, get ready to start putting finish. You know, I, that's when I would turn that on. The good thing is, and it, for those that have, um, for those that have been in the class, you'll notice this cup has had two parts of epoxy in it for the good portion of like two hours. You can stack epoxy in here, you know, hardener and then resin, 
And as long as you don't start to mix it, this can actually sit for hours mm -hmm. like this. We do this in the class. We pre-mix it, or not, I'm sorry. We pre-measure it. We don't pre-mix it. We pre-measure it and put, you know, three and three, and then we set the cups aside. Yep. Then when the students are ready to apply finish, they bring their rod over, they take their mixing stick, they mix it, it's already measured, and then they apply it. So again, if you want to, before you're like ready to go, to help save time, take your epoxy, draw it out, boom. And you can also do multiples, depending on, you know, once you learn how much you gotta do, if you need three and three for a rod, like I know that's what it is, you can measure, do two or three mixes, and then all you've got to do is stir it and go right on the rod. You don't have to then go find your epoxy, mm -hmm. draw it out, um, turn around, do it again. You know, you can really go through. It just really helps speed it up. So. And you got a good tip for, um, this is a, a pretty common step that people tend to miss and look over is the, uh, the metal rod or the stick that's actually used for the epoxy mixer for cleaning it because you can't just let that sit without actually cleaning it. No. So you, I think you put some um Yeah, I just isopropyl. put your regular alcohol in there. Yeah. yeah, that'll do it. So I'm just gonna let that soak till we're done with the show and then I'll wipe it off. Cool, there you go. Let's see, what else we got? Uh, so I have seen a lot of questions regarding uh, high build finish and light and or medium build finish. So essentially the differences in the two your high build is obviously going to be a thicker viscosity finish mm -hmm. um, and the medium or light build is going to be a thinner viscosity. It's typically a little bit easier to work with, especially if you're dealing with, um, you know, say freshwater rods, fly rods. Um, well, and your you're, working time is longer yeah, on a thinner finish. Absolutely. Yep. The, the working time is longer and added to that, your, uh, your drying time tends to be a little bit longer yep. as opposed to a high build. A high build is going to set up a little bit faster. Your 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 uh, light or medium build is going to take a little bit longer yep. to to set up completely. Yep. If you if you really need to get something done pretty quickly, you can take some of that Pro Code high build. And if your man cave or she shed doesn't have AC in it, and it's like a pretty warm day, you know it's 80 or 85 degrees in that thing, you could go out there, mix it up, and put some finish on it, and it'll be good light real quick real quick yep so um yeah what else we got um oh let's do this steve uh gearing <clears throat> you have a thread sticking out of your under wrap uh you applied epoxy it was a good one what yep. do you do to fix it so i would knowing that it's an under wrap and knowing that's not the final product i always go back and check for that because yeah, that happens. It happens a lot if you know you don't cut your metallic short enough, or you know maybe you don't cut your regular nylon or, or whatever enough, and now you're left with a spike, right? So everything looks perfect, and then you got this barb sticking up. Once there's finish on it and it's dried, just take and come right in and shave it off with a razor blade. Just turn the razor blade on its side, come in like this. For example, if this was dried, all you would do is just come right in here and you would just shave it off, right? You would just move right down it. This needs to be dry. Put it back in your hand wrapper or your power wrapper and just cut it right off. Then what you're going to do is you're already going to put another coat of finish back on it, so it's going to cover that. So that, honestly, for an under wrap it works. And even if you do it as an over wrap or your final finish, if you notice there's a spike, you can always come in and shave it off and then come over with a very thin coat and it'll fix it. Yeah. So that's, that's always a great question. And thank you for noticing a thread sticking out of my under wrap, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob's got a good question. What's the average time from start to finish on a basic casting rod uh, without any fancy uh, thread art or decorative um, thread. 
It's going to vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would say an average time, start to finish, get the blank, get all the components, take them out of the packaging. Um, you know, your handle's probably going to take maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Remounts your components. Um, probably an hour or two to wrap the guides. Mm -hmm. Maybe 30 minutes to epoxy. What do you think? Are you asking me on the do that math? I thought you no, were doing no, that. No, no, I'm, I'm saying you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know. Yes, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's a very good... Where I tell most people is, I want to say years ago, my first one from like start to finish was maybe like three or so hours. Yeah. You know, three, maybe four, depending on how many, you know, if I had to go back and get another beer, <laughs> if I had to go back and make another cocktail, if, if I misplaced something, if, if I lost something, if, uh, you know, as I said before, a lot of this rod building and learning is learning like, it's almost like knot tying. We're, most of us are all anglers here. We've all had to learn a new knot. Some of the hardest part about learning a new knot is what fingers you should use. Do you need to take the tag in and hold it in your mouth while you're trying to tie it like this? Or, you know, if you're doing something like a bimini twist and you can put it over something or put it over a knee or, you know, you're always like learning what's best for you or, or you know, should you wrap it this direction? Should you wrap it that direction? I mean, I, I know if you take a poll around here and we've even talked about it and people are like, no, 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 I can only wrap guides this way. Mm -hmm. I can only wrap them this way, or I only like the rod turning away from me when I'm finishing. Me, I like it turning towards me, and I can wrap both ways or left, right, it, it doesn't matter. Right. But not everybody's like that. So you, you kind of have to get in a groove, and I think your, your times are, are right. You know, I mean, now I can do a handle in 10 minutes, pretty much, um, and I do multiples, you know, I'll do them all kind of together, set them aside, and then, you know, I can wrap a rod in about 30 or 45 minutes, and my finishing takes a little bit longer because I'm a little more meticulous, and I use mm -hmm. heat, and I try to make sure air bubbles are out under guide feet and stuff, but yeah, I mean, from wrapping a guide and finishing it, I'm at an hour where I was a couple hours before, right. and that was mainly just because I was making mistakes and dropping a guide or the thread, I couldn't get it to jump up on the guide foot or, or something, right? You know, so yeah, your time's going to vary, but I would say whatever your first rod build is, do an approximate time, you should easily be able to cut that in half. For sure. Yeah. At least half, if yep. not a third, right? So, you know, could be three hours, then you get it down to an hour. That's pretty solid for just a regular casting rod with black guides and black grips and no thread art and you know, it's good to go. Yeah. And so. that's the whole idea of the show is to make it more efficient so you have time to, you know, because nobody really wants to sit down and, and take six hours to build a rod, right? I mean, sure. not a lot of people have that time. Well, with thread work, I can understand For that. sure. But, you know, if, if you're just doing the, you know, the basic stuff, I mean, if it takes you six hours, we understand that. But trust me, you'll shave that. Mm -hmm. You'll shave that way down. Sure. But, yeah, you're right. You know, it's just one of those things as you, as you go through it. Um, you know, Jonathan's got a question here. I touched on it earlier. Hopefully you picked that up. What's the trick uh, to getting knots started and keeping them tight when wrapping thread? I've tried many videos and I just can't seem to grasp it. You know, I, I showed where you always need to wrap over your tag in. So you'll come off and go around it. Go around two, three, try four times. And then tug on your tag in while you're pulling your standing line and what that does is it creates a tighter wrap. So the, the standing line will actually tighten around that tag in and then make a few wraps over that tag, cut it off and let it roll and you'll be, you'll be good to go. So don't just go around the rod like one time and expect it to catch every single time. Uh, try two, three times and, and that'll help kind of give it something to grab on to. Yeah. So. Uh, Dave, do you spine rods on bare blank or with handle and components in place before gluing? Dave, you want to spine your blank um, without anything on it. Uh, and you really want to do this right when you get the rod blank in. You want to make sure there's, you know, because stuff does happen in shipping. Because you'll catch it, a defect. It might have got damaged, a defect. Okay. 
you want to spine that blank, um, you know, as soon as possible. That way, you know, before you put any components on there, the handle, etc., you don't want to go down that road of getting halfway done with your rod. Then you might go to spine it, and then all of a sudden something bad happens. So. Yep. Now, in addition to that, you know, I'll spine it, mark it, <clears throat> and then when I get everything dry fitted, I, I tend to check it again. Right. Um, try to check it without a butt cap on it. Because if you, you know, cork is dense enough and hard enough that cork will roll pretty easy, but there can be some flat spots in the cork that might give you a false reading. Uh, EVA especially, you know, it might be a little softer if you're like really, you know, if you've got a heavy power rod blank and you really need to put a little force to get it. So if you put your reel seat and your grips on there and everything's lined up, maybe before you put that fighting butt or that butt cap on, check it one more time just to make sure you're, you're ready to rock. And that's, you know, I'll even do it even if, you know, the glue's not set up. But try not to do it with a fighting butt on it. So, yep. Um, William, what's the most efficient method to epoxy a large area, such as over stickers and wraps? William, hopefully I answered that for you, bud. Um, if you've got an RBS Pro, you can move quickly, use a wide brush, um, if you saw when I was putting finish over it, I was going around the rod blank on thread wraps. So like a regular guide wrap where the, where the wrap goes perfectly around the rod blank like that. I tend to lay the brush on it and let the brush do the work around that. Now, if I'm making, it, you know, if there's cross wraps or there's l like longer wraps, I also work long ways across the rod blank. So sometimes as it spins, and if it's spinning fast and you put a, put a brush on it, you can kind of create grooves in that finish. Now, that will help level itself out, and you can add some heat, but remember the, the epoxy can only level so much. You know, if you've got it really globbed on there kind of haphazardly, people will notice like, well, my finish is all, it's got lumpy in it. Well, it can only level so much. Uh, it does a really, really great job, but it's got its limits as well. So what I do is, especially over a decal, I'm going lengthwise. I'm making long brush strokes across that decal. And I do my decals in multiple coats just because the finish, when it's, when it's rolling and leveling over a vinyl decal, sometimes it doesn't want to work over it as easy, especially if you have a lot of finish on it. So do a very thin coat and work long ways in your brush strokes. Add a little heat and I think you'll notice that uh, it'll get better and better. So, cool. Let me just do one more question. Okay. Uh, I think it's time for a giveaway. Yeah. James, this is a great question. What is the best way to hold very small guides in place and get the thread to go up on the guide foot? I'd recommend three things. I'd recommend for one, uh, micro guide bands okay. from CRB. They are really, really small. I think we might have some under there, the red ones. Perfect. Actually, do you see a guide under there too that I can actually maybe use? Now you're asking an awful lot. So for one, here are the micro guide bands. As you can see, they are really, really small and I've got a guide, perfect, thank you guys. So there's the micro guide bands. All you gotta do is just pluck one of these guys off. And of course you can use multiple ones if you need to, right? So those are gonna help to actually keep the guide on the blank itself, right? Yep. So the second part of that is, I'd recommend filing your guide foot. Yeah. Right? See, you know, some of these guide feet, I'll show this one for example. See if that might be a little too hard to see. It is. But, Let's see. It doesn't help to have a gray shirt on, Ooh, right? Yeah. All right, that's not bad. I'll try to keep it right there. I was going to say, quit playing tag, you'll be all so, right. So if you can see that, this has a little bit of a ramp. It's actually not that bad. But if you can get more of a sharper angle, not as much of a blunt edge on yeah. that guide foot, the thread will go up it, right? Absolutely. The third part of that is if, sorry, I got to reposition this. I can barely hold it there is if you can tuck, put this guide on your rod blank with the micro guide band, and then maybe tuck a small piece of cardboard 
or piece of paper, a folded piece of paper on the back side of this guide foot and it will actually pop up the back and it'll push the front down. And what that allow you to do is it keeps a little more pressure on the front edge, this part right here of the guide foot and it allows that thread to actually go up that ramp a little bit easier. So three different options and you can That's use fantastic. all of them if you need to. Absolutely. There you go. And I know the cardboard paper business card ramp business trick card for sure. is, is great for like a size 25. For sure, any size guide. Um, like a spinning guide, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes they're a little bit taller and they, because a lot of the weight of that guide the is ring. in that ring, so it maybe wants to go this way, but work your business card in and it tips that nose down a little bit more and off you go. There you so, go. yeah, and of course, gosh, prep those guide feet. You yeah. know, use that Dremel, use a file, something like that. Um, yeah, that's, there you go. that is the way. Um, let's see, who else we got? We got anything here? We got anything here? Uh, David, I'll hit a couple of these here real quick. Um, David, are one-piece rods better than a two-piece rod? Uh, David, in today's world, feral technology has come, I mean, light years from, you know, I, I actually turn 38 next month, 38 going on 16. And <laughs> so, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a two-piece rod was very blocky. You know, you would, you could feel a ferrule, you could see a ferrule in the bend profile. And, and now between, you know, slim profile uh, ferrules, between uh, reinforced ferrules that, you know, have no larger OD on the blank and it just, it's seamless, they're great. So a one piece rod, you know, if, if you can get away with a one piece rod, great. But there's really no reason to fear a two piece rod. So if you've got a surf rod, I mean, you know, we throw very expensive four-piece fly rods, and those are four pieces, and they feel incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have no no issues with a four-piece fly rod. So that feral technology has come a long way. Don't be afraid of using a multi-piece nowadays, as opposed to you know a long time ago. The technology has come a really long way. Um, D Daily, why do you recommend Pro Coat medium build over the high build? Um, I don't recommend it per se over the high build. Just remember they all have their place. The, the medium build is something that I use on my day-to-day -day rod builds. The high build is something I use on an offshore build where I'm trying to you know, cover you know, more layers of thread, larger guide feet, things like that. Um, that you just don't have to do on a fly rod or a regular inshore rod or a bass rod or something like that. And I try, and I walk that line very, very closely. I like the least amount of finish possible. That's just me. I mean, I, I would rather see like tiny little ridges in the thread than see big giant footballs of finish. Right. Um, so I try to go with the thinnest finish possible, whether it's Threadmaster light, whether it's Pro coat medium build. Um, I only go to the high build if I'm trying to cover a lot of thread, or you know, if I'm working around you know roller guides or something like that. I, I it's not that it's bad. It's just they both have their place. So, yep. yep. What do you think? You want to give something away? Let's do it. Trying to get that credit card back out. Grand prize giveaway. Tell us what we got. What so do we have? We have a CRB multi-option rod kit. Perfect. With the epoxy mixer and a finishing kit. Mm. Big grand mm. prize. Mm. Just call my name and I'll take it home right now and build it. I don't think so. I don't think you're the winner tonight. The winner though is Drew Turner from Facebook. Perfect. Drew Turner, congratulations. Awesome. That's now, a great prize. for all our winners, congratulations. Make sure, slide into our DMs there on Facebook. Uh, send us an email. You can message us. You know, if you don't have Facebook, you can call into customer service. You can tell them you want it on the show. You'll get it to us. You can email us at support at mudhole.com. Uh, again, if you don't have Facebook. Um, but if you do have Facebook, run over to the Mudhole Facebook page. Slide in our DMs there and say, hey, it's me, Drew Turner. I won last night. 
and we'll get it out to you. And of course, you know, we ask a few different little, uh, you know, uh, questions whether you want, you know, a certain thread color or or something like that. Uh, well, if they don't have Facebook, they could have won through YouTube, Jay. That's how. We're having a little fun on the teleprompter tonight, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. We had a ball, yeah. as, as, as always. As always. We, um, you know, we talked about some great tips to lower your build time. We showed you some cool tools. Uh, we talked about that virtual rod building class, mm -hmm. which is, is excellent. I mean, it's, you know, Todd and Jesus and Cindy and Kurt. I mean, I know I'm leaving a couple out, but a Buzz is in there. I'm telling you, we have the best instructors, period. They're doing a heck of a job. You're going to find that at mudhole.com slash classes. That is going to give you everything you need to know how to buy one, how to send that link to somebody that says, hey, is this what you want for your birthday? I can get you this. Things like that. So that's how you find it, mudhole.com slash classes. Um, congratulations to all the winners. We had Shane Seal with the set of Extreme Reamers. We had Tony Miller coming out of YouTube, the four spool advanced hand wrapper, which is a gem. If you don't have that, you need to get that. Uh, and then of course, Drew Turner with the multi-option rod kit, epoxy mixer finishing kit. He's the big runner tonight. Um, also, Hunter has paid down that credit card bill. He is ready for that 10,000 uh, member giveaway over at the Mudhole Live Rod Builders Workshop. It's going to be good. Yeah, if you guys are not members yet, I would suggest within the next couple days, maybe week, I wouldn't let it go too long because that group is going to hit 10,000 very soon. Yep. So Make sure you're in there. Uh, get your mom and your grandma and your dad, your cousin, everybody, get them all in there um, because they might learn something. They might pick up a new hobby. Uh, I spoke to a guy today. He's going to build a fishing rod. His son, his wife, they all went you know, fishing, they thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to, to do all this together, you know, with everything going on in the world today, having a little family time indoors building a fishing rod and having a little family time outdoors build, uh, using that fishing rod to catch a fish is really the way to go. Now, the next show. Yes. Sometimes we ask y'all because we really <laughs> care. But this time we're going to go back <laughs> to a show that we had planned before 2020 had other ideas and we're going to do the marbling show. So we have done a marbling show before. You guys have seen the rerun. Now we're gonna do marbling 2.0 or 3.0. I don't, I don't really know. We're in episode like 58, I think. Are we 58, 57? I don't know. We've been doing this for over four years. Our, our anniversary was June 6th of 2016. So we've been at this a minute. So marbling will come to y'all live here in the penthouse on August 18th at 6.30 Eastern time. So it's gonna be a good one. Oh yeah, it's one of my favorites. Marbling is so cool. It, it's just not something you see on any other rods out there typically. You're certainly not gonna see it on a factory. Yeah. So it's Certainly something not. you can incorporate, and um, yeah, yeah, and then I know you guys might have a. You, you mentioned it earlier on the, you know, shark rod. Yep, you got a little trip coming up soon, so we'll have some some really cool content to share there. Yep, we're gonna try to sneak out, do a little fishing, do a little rod building. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some uh, some cool photos and content, some fish catches uh, coming to y'all by that August eighteenth show. We'll be we'll be there getting our getting our fish on. So. Um, yeah, and new rod recipes too. I know that was, I knew that was a that was a uh, kind of a big hit. I guess yeah, I would say you absolutely. know while, while we were away doing doing the rod recipes was nice, and we appreciate y'all's feedback on all the stuff we do. So anytime we can make it easier or more fun or more efficient, we try to do that. Absolutely. So what else you got? I think that's it. Is that it? All right, that's cool. It. So tonight, as always, in the war room, we had Guffy, we had Taylor, of course. Uh, Hoffman was here in the pre-show getting us all straight and in line. Uh, Steve was in the back there with the boys, of course, and Nick and Jay on the ones and twos. Hunter, as always, my left-hand man here in the penthouse. And uh, I think that's it. That's it. Until the next show. Until the next show. We'll see you guys August 18th for Marbling 630 Eastern here. For Hunter and me, Chris, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Have a great one.